Thanks, everyone who is on this line. Back over to you, Pastor. All right. Thank you so much, Sister Veronica. And my heart was going out to you tonight. <clears throat> it was kind of like pulling teeth tonight. <laughs> but uh, praise the Lord for faithfulness. We appreciate it. Good evening and welcome to all of you. Uh, we appreciate the, um, if you missed it, uh, it's a wonderful prayer time from 745 uh, until about a, a quarter after. And I uh, personally appreciate it. They were focusing on leadership uh, tonight and uh, they did a wonderful, wonderful job. As you know, uh, we choose not to, to record the prayer time uh, because I believe that those things are very personal and uh, we don't want people watching that back or listening to it. So I hope you understand that. Well, we are now in the month of June and uh, we're still dealing with our, our book, Surviving the Shaking. I hope that you have enjoyed it thus far. We have gone through some, some interesting uh, topics and uh, we had just finished talking about the spirit of prophecy. And now we're dealing with um, justification and sanctification. And uh, things kind of slowed down just a little bit on last Wednesday after all that exciting talk about uh, Ellen White and the spirit of prophecy, but it slowed down for a reason. Brothers and sisters, this is the most important subject in all of our lives. How is it that we are saved? Uh, there is no more important topic as it relates to those who have given their life uh, to, to Jesus Christ. And so we're going to be on it for a couple of weeks now, uh, and it's going to get um, a little complicated. But don't let that intimidate you. Don't let that tire you out. Make us stop and talk about it in depth because your very salvation depends on how you see this topic. So I hope that everybody is good with that. And, uh, and so we're gonna begin, uh, but before we do that, we're gonna have a word of prayer and, uh, and then I'll be, as always, looking for people to volunteer to, to read and we're gonna stop and pause and discuss. And I know, because I looked at it already, it's a wonderful subject but it all count depends upon your participation. So we're looking for you to, to participate. This is a safe place. You don't have to worry about sounding dumb or anything like that because the goal here is for us to become one. That's the goal. And uh, we can't do that if we don't have the conversation. So, so let's pray. Lord, thank you for all that we have experienced thus far. We thank you for the prayer warriors who have come on early and have done their research and brought their scriptures and prayer points. And uh, for everyone else who have come along and joined along the way, uh, just looking for your divine comfort and for your presence, your help with whatever it may be. And some just wanna say thank you for what you've already done. Our Lord, as we take a moment and uh, open up this topic of justification. We pray once again that you give us the kind of clarity that creates confidence in you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So again, this is chapter five. Salvation is closer than you think. We've already started this chapter. Uh, uh, we've already started this chapter and the key to it all was the 1888 message, righteousness by faith. And so we're going to start to unpack that in earnest between tonight and next week, Lord willing. Okay, so this section is called the cart before the horse. We started reading just the beginning of it on last week, and now we're gonna get into it. We have a volunteer to read tonight. I'll read, Pastor Elderstone. Thank you, Elderstone. Whenever you're ready. Oh, okay. Cart before the horse, page 51, paragraph three. 
In fact, Ellen White went through her own experience of confusion on these points. Quote, my ideas concerning justification and sanctification were confused. These two states were presented to my mind as separate and distinct from each other. Yet I failed to comprehend the difference or understand the meaning of the terms. And all the explanations of the preachers increased my difficulties. Quote taken from Testimonies for the Church, volume one, page 23. The key to victory in both our personal experience and that of the church at large will be found in correctly understanding these various theological concepts and why or how they relate to each other in the salvation process. The devil is determined that we shall never do it. He knows that such knowledge will spiritually set us free. Wow. Wow. Before we even get started, good. Just uh, <laughs> two paragraphs in this uh, seem to be quite shocking to me. The first one being that Sister White herself, and I, you know, I, I got to say how much I appreciate her. Um, as one of the pioneers of the church, there's no need for her to admit that she struggled with something. Uh, and I see that she has no problem saying, I am a human being. <laughs> I, I am not a supernatural force that knows all and all that. Uh, I struggle with understanding justification and sanctification. That's the first shocker. Mm -hmm. The second one is that no matter how much preachers tried to explain it, it became more confusing for her. And I'm sure that if people would admit it, they have had the same experience, All right? Then finally, on the next paragraph that Elder Stone read, we see that the devil is determined that we never understand it. And the biggest shocker of all is why? Should we understand justification and sanctification, we will be set free. Now, I find that interesting because being in church going into the watery grave, becoming a member of the body, isn't that supposed to set us free? So clearly there is a level of captivity in church if we are not careful to understand the things of God in the way that he's taught them to us. Very interesting. Okay, Elder Stone, uh, let's, let's continue and then we're gonna have a discussion here shortly. Paragraph four, notice this statement concerning what shall happen when we rightly understand justification's relationship to the plan of salvation. Quote, the end of God and man is not willing that this truth, justification, should be clearly presented, for he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken, unquote, taken from Gospel Workers, page 161. Okay, I'm going to stop. I, I promise you I won't stop on every page. But uh, again, what's significant about this particular quote is that it, it, it comes from an instruction manual to the pastors. And yet, it's people like me who work hard to add an element of bondage when we explain justification and sanctification. I want you to just think about that for a second. Sister White is not, is not mincing words. She's saying that it is the enemy that don't want people to understand that they can be free indeed. And she's saying it to the pastors. And yet, the people most responsible historically for keeping Advent people in bondage are pastors. We just came out of this long phase of fear mongering that lasted through the civil rights movement. And um, people still have not completely shaken that off or even considered, uh, well, maybe we need to refine 
how we are explaining ourselves and defining things. So uh, I'll just pause right here now because I, I'm sure someone has some thoughts and we don't want those thoughts to be lost because we go too far down the road. So uh, you don't have to, but if you have thoughts about what I've said or what Elder Stone has read, you can come in right now. Okay, I guess for you're just me, taking it in. Go ahead. For me, that statement, that, that is twice that we've seen that, that mm -hmm. if we understood, if we understood the truth about justification and sanctification, if we received it fully, Satan's power would be broken that's mm -hmm. over us, even mm -hmm. in the church. So it still remains to me, and that's something I've known, even in the church, we're not totally free. We're not living the life that God meant for us to live. What do you what do you think that is? I think according to this statement, we don't understand the full truth about justification and sanctification. Hmm. It's the same yeah, I, difference about truly, truly uh, accepting being loved. Sometimes people, you're, you're trying to express your love to them, but you're speaking your language, not theirs. And they're, they're not able to receive fully what you're trying to give them. But once they do, once you get that key, oh, their love language is gifts and I'm just giving them praises. So, or I'm just giving them service or their love language is hugs. They, they like to be touched and I don't touch them. I just do for them. Mm -hmm. and, and we have this, well, you, you don't love me, but God's love encompasses all of that. And once we receive it, if we, when we actually bask in the, the love that God has lavished on us is very transformative. And then we are able to love others without reservation. There we go. Can, can I restate what you said? I see those hands, I'm coming to you. Can I restate Elder Stone what you just said? Uh, if we have an honest conversation here, let's not waste it. At the basis, basic core experience of all of us, one of the things that we're sure about is that men cannot be trusted. That, that, that whatever it is that men want to give me, they have a motive behind it and I don't always know what their motives are. So then we have a very difficult problem when we're supposed to be redeemed and reform men in the church of God, they're still men, right? And then I gotta try to, in my mind, transition from how I'm used to dealing with men that can't be trusted to completely trusting an invisible God. Because everything else in life says that uh, there is a lasting consequence to my mistakes. Everything else in life says that, that people use each other. They, they misrepresent themselves to get what they want. And God comes with pure love. And we wonder if that can be possible. Because everything else in my life says that is not possible. Even the best of people that I know have failed me at some point. So you see now how it can be difficult, even if you want to, to accept righteousness by faith. Let me stop and go on. Sister Audrey, go right ahead. Or yes, Sister Audrey. We... Go ahead. Uh, what I'm going to say is we combine justification and sanctification as one entity and we feel that we have to do something we have to work at this in order to think that we can be saved case in point i've been in congregations when the pastor says how many have uh, believe you are saved and very few hands are raised 
because <laughs> they, they think that because of the life that I'm living, they're judging themselves and not what God has given us as a gift. And so mm -hmm. there's that confusion there. And so many of us think that we have to work and we're in the, um, the uh, sanctification mode and not ex mm -hmm. looking at it as justification that God has given us this plan. That's yeah. my idea. Yeah, that, that is a very good point. And I wanna tell you that most of us have gotten it wrong. Um, and uh, even the, in trying to split them, we have gotten that wrong too. But, but again, it is a very uh, instinctive and, and um, organic impulse. And those are the hardest things to control is what organically happens within you. Uh, but we're gonna, the lesson actually addresses that very issue later on, Sister Audrey. I think this is Deacon Kingman who has a hand up. Yes, um, the conversation that we're having is a very necessary component of helping us grasp like what Sister White was saying, even in her difficulties. We have to understand that Satan is a master of confusion. Mm. And with that ingredient that he is stirring up in our spirit, when we get to justification and the simple part of it for lack of a better way of saying it is that we have to believe and accept the justification. And then with that, we are able to experience the sanctification in how we behave. So it's not something that is necessary for us to say other than yes, I believe in Jesus Christ. Yes, I believe in God. Yes, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Yes, I believe that I am just, I, I have justification and that gives me sanctification. And rather than we feel like it's something that we have to demonstrate to others so that they would say, oh, that person seems to be justified and sanctified for the way I'm expressing it. So thank you for that opportunity, amen. Amen, very well said. Thank you so much. Um, Sister Veronica, oh, oh uh, there's a phone caller trying to come in. Yep. So go ahead, um, and then Sister Veronica. I the battle. Behind her. I look at those, those two words and I can understand justification because that seems to be forgiving me for what I did before. My problem is the sanctification part. Um, in order for us to do the sanctification part, we have to have faith. And that's, that's a hard thing to have. A lot of times how our faith uh, grows or didn't grow or shrank has to do with maybe the way we were raised or our family, our parents, how they treated us. Um, uh, what we got from them. I know for myself, I spent a, a lot of time when I was younger worrying about the doing part because the pastor was saying, give Bible studies. The pastor said, go out and give out tracts. The, the pastor said, uh, uh, do in-gathering and all knock on doors and all this other stuff. And when you're home with little children, it's oh, kind of hard to get out to do all that stuff. Excuse me, just for a second. Uh, so and so, and uh, you just you um, them, please mute yourself. We have we have in a prayer session here. You can't. We don't we don't need to hear everything that's happening in your background. Thank you. Go ahead, Sister Battle. And and it is kind of hard to. In other words, it's it's for me right now. Believing, I know Jesus is there. He's with me every day, all the time. Holy Spirit, the Father, my guardian angel, I know they're all there. But in a way, there are times when I don't feel them or I can't believe that when Jesus comes, I have this, this well, tell you the truth, I have this idea sometimes that when he comes, he's going to look at me and say, 
Oh, Elva, I'm sorry. You, you, you just didn't make it. You ju I just didn't make it. I can't get to the place yet of being sure. Hmm. And maybe somebody else has that, that feeling too. But it has more to do with, less to do with doing things and more to do with believing him. Yes. Well, we're going to cover all of that, Sister Battle. Just a moment. We're going to cover. We're going to cover all of that in detail. We're not going to rush through this. Um, you know that means that where we could take a week or two to be done with a chapter in this book, it might take a month <clears throat> to do one chapter, and I'm just fine with that. If all of you are. Um, but uh, many of the things that we believe are factors in this are not even relevant. And, uh, and, and so the book is very good with breaking this down. I'll just give you one thought now since you brought it up. Uh, and the, the issue is in, in sanctification, we've all been taught that this is largely based on how we respond to God's grace and justification. That is not true. God is doing all of it. Justification, sanctification, and glorification. Let me give you an example really quick, and then we're going to, going to move on. What did Mary do to conceive Jesus? Meaning uh, Joseph's wife, Mary, and Matthew. What did she do to to conceive Jesus. She didn't do anything. The angel showed up and announced to her that you are blessed and highly favored. And, highly favored. and everything that happened after that, the Holy Spirit did it, right? So, so Mary, if you could say she did anything, she carried the blessing and allowed it to grow in her. Brothers and sisters, this is the main component of sanctification. In other words, she accepted it. Well, but wait a minute. Let's think about that for a second. Did the angel ask her if she would like the blessing, or did he tell her that she was receiving it? Well, he told her she was receiving it, and she accepted it. Maybe, but that wasn't a factor. <laughs> you see, and, but, but I don't want to start a big, big discussion. Yeah. About I just want to show share a, a way uh, mm -hmm. That's an easy way because everybody knows Mary and the virgin conception and birth and all of that. Show you a way that's crystal clear that God is the active agent in our redemption. So Sister Veronica, mm -hmm. been waiting for a while. So you come on. And, um, Sister Whitlock, she already had her hand up. So we're going to okay. see Sister Veronica, then Sister Whitlock, and we'll go from there. Okay. I, I will try to go quick with this one. So it's just my thought. When I look at scientific, um, justification and sanctification, you know, we give our life to Christ and, you know, we get baptized. And after we get baptized, it's just the start of the work that God is going to do in us. You know, when we come to Christ, then know the work start. He work on us daily, mm -hmm. you know, by the Holy Spirit, renew our mind or, you know, work on us. Our behaviors change and we gradually grow in Christ each and every day as we go. He sanctify us. It kind of reminds me, Pastor, and I may be wrong, of the, the former rain and the latter rain, you mm -hmm. know, how it kind of reminds me like that because yes. you know we receive him and then you know the holy spirit works on us work on our lives and chip off everything you know that christ for us to get to that perfection before we can get to the glorification stage um that's that's my intake well that was a good good point sister sister Whitlock. i'm sorry for, for you having to wait but go right no, ahead that's okay <laughs> that's, i think maybe i see this excuse me, kind of different. I see Jesus doing it all. I see Jesus being the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world when none of us was here. And he said in the garden to Adam and Eve in front of Satan that he was going to put in enmity. Mm -hmm. He's going to do it. Jesus mm -hmm. does it all. I think our problem is 
we try to do it ourselves or blame it on other people. But I think the Bible says God so loved the world, he gave his son. To me, all of this is justification. He was going to do it because he wanted to and we couldn't do it. Sanctification is also him. When we read our Bibles and pray to him every day, we walk with him like Enoch did. We're, we can't change ourselves. The Bible says, can a leopard change his spots or Ethiopian his color? No. And glorification, we don't have anything to do with that. Jesus is doing it all. We just have to have faith and believe him. And, and we cannot look at ourselves and remember, well, I told that last, so I probably ain't going to be safe. <laughs> if you tell a lie, you come boldly before the throne, and if you're truly sorry, he'll forgive you. He'll bear it in the bottom of the sea and remember it no more. <clears throat> Nobody is our reason for doing anything. We do it because we want to, because we were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. Now, I'm going to leave it alone, but Jesus is doing it all. If we get to heaven, we we're going to take off our crowns and put it at his feet. Ain't nothing we can do. If, if, if it did, he wouldn't have went through all that suffering. Now I'm going to let somebody else. Sorry. Yes, I'm indeed. Yes, indeed, Sister Whitlock. Uh, it's, it's not just, it's, it's not something wrong with you. You're seeing it correctly. Uh, but it messes with our ego. Because remember what I said at the beginning of this conversation we inherently believe that people cannot be trusted. And uh, the reason that we believe that is not just the experiences we've had in our lives. We know that we can't be trusted, right? And so the, the issue then becomes, we look through the glasses of our own shortcomings. And so that can lead to a very bitter Christian experience. And uh, what we think is faith is often lack of faith. What you just said, Sister Betty, sounds like uh, to some people, it sounds like being naive. It sounds like you're presuming upon God. And God is clearly saying that his shoulders are wide enough and big enough, not just to help me, but to save everybody who wants to be saved. Why can't God just be God? But uh, as I said, the lesson goes through it quite eloquently and thoroughly. So I don't want to teach the lesson from my perspective. We just going to teach it. Uh, go ahead, Deacon Parker. Well, two things, and I'll try to keep it short. Number one, mm -hmm. I think the word sanctification scares people. Mm. Because sanctification is nothing but being cleaned up. And we all, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. So all of us are being cleaned up if we allow it to happen to us. Mm. Going back to your statement about Mary. Mary did not tell God, okay, yeah, I, I agree with you. Mm. She just said, you're a handmaid. But she mm. still did not totally understand exactly what she was doing. Mm. Because if she did, when she went looking for Jesus, she would have known exactly where to find him. Because mm. Jesus made the statement, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Mm -hmm. We are the same way. We take the first step of giving our life to Christ, being saved, being justified, and we think that's it. Everything else we have to do. But no, we have to depend on God, lean on God, trust in God, yield to God to be sanctified. And it's not an easy process. And it's a process that's going to continue until the Lord returns. We have got to learn within our mind and in our hearts that we need Jesus to clean us up. Nothing that we do, nothing that, nothing that we ever do will be enough to sanctify ourselves. That's why we need Christ because he is the, not just a saving element, he's the cleansing <laughs> element. Mm-hmm. Well said, well said. Y'all are doing fantastic tonight. 
Okay, Elder Stone, let's see if we can get a little bit more done before we close it tonight. Page 52. For years, Satan has been fighting within Adventism to deny justification by faith its rightful place. In 1890, we received this clear statement revealing his strategy to confuse justification with what takes place within us through our efforts to keep the law. Quote, the danger has been presented to me again and again of entertaining <laughs> as, as a people false ideas of justification by faith. I have been shown for years that Satan would work in a special manner to confuse the mind on this point. The law of God has been largely dealt upon, dwelt upon, and has been presented to congregations almost as destitute of, of the knowledge of Jesus Christ and his relation to the law as was the offering of Cain. I have been shown that many have been kept from the faith because of the mixed, confused ideas of salvation, because ministers have worked in a wrong manner to reach hearts. Mercy. The point that has been urged upon the mind for years is the imputed righteousness of Christ, justification. I have wondered that this matter was not made the subject of discourses in our churches throughout the land when the matter has been kept so constantly urged upon me and I have made it the subject of nearly every discourse and talk I have given to the people. No, oh, let's pause, right? We cannot just gloss over that. All right now, uh, uh, all you spirit of prophecy people, you, you folks that that uh, that got that, that got every day you got to be deep in spirit of prophecy. Look at what Sister White says that her main subject has been in nearly every discourse and talk that she's given to the people. What has been her main subject? The imputed righteousness of Christ. The, yeah. So would you say that would be important then? Yes. Yeah. So, so by now, all of you should be wondering, what is it that Satan has done to make this so confusing? What's confusing about justification that has caused people to be on the verge of being saved and not? What, what, what has been the issue? And I want to go back to some context clues she gave. All right. Elder uh, Stone read this just a second ago. The law of God has been largely dwelt upon and has been presented to congregations. So the law has been largely dwelt upon. The law has been largely dwelt upon. What law? The, do Adventists largely dwell upon? The Ten Commandments. Oh, one of, yeah, the Ten Commandments, but we put special emphasis on one of them. The, the Sabbath. Commandments. The, the Sabbath. Sabbath. That's right. As Adventists, the law of God has been largely dwelt upon and has been presented to congregations. Almost, listen to this now, there's nothing wrong with dwelling upon it and presenting it. But where's the rub? Almost as destitute of the knowledge of Jesus Christ and his relation to the law as was the offering of Cain. This is her big context clue. What is she trying to tell us? Anybody want to take a crack at it or you want me to just tell you? You can't keep the Holy Sabbath. You can't uh, keep the Holy Sabbath without the, the knowledge and love of Jesus Christ. No, no, I want to know what the error is that we've made as a church in our presentation. So I think that saying that Cain was trying to save himself. He wanted to give God what he wanted to give him. I 
it seems like to me, God is saying, let go and let God. You know, we're supposed to have a peace that passes understanding. You're, we're not supposed to be working our way to heaven like we dig in a garden or something. He, God is doing it. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you let him come in and daily do what he tells you to do, it would be easy. And don't worry, I don't understand this wondering about what other people are doing to you. What do they have to do with your salvation? Nobody can keep you from being well, lost. Yeah, well, but listen, listen now. Uh, I, I got to come back to your comment as well as Elder Stone's because I don't want to miss the point that I'm trying to get at the, at the moment. You, you're making, both of you have brought up some valid things, but when we talk about in trying to do good, we have made an error. And I brought you into the law and showed you which law that we have emphasized. And uh, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, uh, Elder Hood, Maybe. wait a minute, wait a minute, Elder Hood, go ahead. Yes, I think um, in <laughs> reference to the, the law, um, we've made it as if keeping the Sabbath is the salvation for um, Adventists. Yes. <laughs> yes. And it, and also, I'm sorry, if you, if you weren't finished, you can go ahead. No, go ahead. Then we've also made it the thing that keeps Sunday keepers from yeah, being saved. Being, right. It may not have been intentional in the beginning, but once there was a great disappointment, I need y'all to hear me real good here. Once there was a great disappointment, and the whole world laughed at, put it in newspaper, drew pictures, made jokes about Adventists being wrong. There was an overcorrection at that point. I remember a few weeks ago, I told you that this country overcorrected. And Barack Obama was president for two terms and people loved him. The overcorrection was Donald Trump, right? He said, well, wait a minute, well, well, are we now the minority is what some white people were saying. Are we the minority now? And no, you were, no, white people were not the minority, but some people reacted in such a negative way to it that they put Trump in office, not because he was qualified, but because he was the opposite of Obama. And like manner, at Venice, with being laughed at, mocked, trying to get their job back, can't get the stuff back they gave away, and all of that, we found something to distinguish us from other Christians that, let's be real, made us better. I mean, hey, let's just have some real conversations here. Nobody will say those words, but that's the way we wielded it like a sword. And that's how we lined up with Cain. Cain was, wait a minute, Cain was not. Cain was not giving his offering out of love. He was giving his offering because it was asked of him and then he expected status for it. He expected to be celebrated for it. And that missed the whole point of God wanting to commune with him. Now go ahead, whoever that was, because we have some other um, people raising their hand. The, the Jews put 12, over 1,200 laws on the Sabbath alone. And in some ways, that's what we did in the Adventist church because it was mostly you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't go here, you can't go there, you can't talk to this person, you can't talk to that person, you can't wear this, you can't wear that. And it was can't, 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 can't. And we did pretty much what the Jews did back in their time. That's right. We crowded it so much with with a, a pile so much uh, um, um, negative stuff on it that it it never became a a a a joy. It never became something that we were glad to to keep because there was all this other stuff piled on it. And I think we did some of the same things, uh, just like I was saying before. Uh, 
preachers used to talk about what we need to go out and do and 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 uh, give out tracts or we'll Bible, we'll, all of that stuff, which if we accepted or received what Christ had to give us. All of those things would not have been done because some pastor stood up there and said that you got to do this and you got to do that because they're not going to be any starless crowns in heaven. But we would be doing it because we love him and we want other people to know about him. We want them to, to, to share what we have. But it would be out of love, not because somebody uh, is taking uh, mission st- uh, statistics every Sabbath morning. All right. All right, Deacon King, man. Yes, this is Pamela. I was oh, going to okay. say the same Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing about us uh, making the uh, Sabbath being salvific. I mean, we had a huge discussion uh, when we talked about the Sabbath uh, for Sabbath school, uh, mm-hmm. where I said that I stayed away from uh, the Seventh Day Adventist Church for five mm-hmm. years because somebody was pushing what I can and cannot do on the Sabbath and let, instead of let me join the church and coming to that realization myself. Uh, people get real judgmental about what other people do or don't do on the Sabbath. Uh, one of the issues was working and they said, okay, well, somebody finally said, okay, you're a doctor so you can work. But as time went on, I decided, okay, well, I don't want to work. But the Sabbath was a delight because I made that, I came to my own realization about how I needed and wanted to uh, celebrate and set aside the Sabbath for myself. But if we're knocking people over the head about what you can or can't do on the Sabbath, you're keeping a lot of people away from the message that we have. Well, right. Well, that's a very interesting uh, uh, perspective there. And um, all of it goes back to what I said in the beginning. Our nature is that people cannot be trusted. And over time, we arrive at a point where mm-hmm. we're going to be skeptical about people telling us anything. If, if our relationship is not built on our encounters with God, then we're going to resist no matter how they say it. You say it nice as possible. It's still going to be resistance. Elder Hood, you want to come back? Well, yes, yeah, sort of along that vein is, you know, yes. Um, yeah, we should um, allow individuals time to acclimate themselves. And at, and at the same time, we do have a responsibility. Um, I think we're in reference to what you're saying, where we've come up short is not what we have said or what we can or cannot do because, I mean, the commandments are clear and it has been more the spirit behind uh, why I'm saying what I'm saying, not what I'm saying is wrong, but the spirit behind uh, what I'm saying. And, and, And I think you pretty much summed it up in reference to Uh, the great disappointment and so because of that stigma that was placed upon the people now we have used um the sabbath as a as a a badge of of uh as a um as a as a as a rod of correction uh, as a place where we can poke out our chest and make ourselves you know to be um, this group of elitists. And in reality, it's our love relationship. I seen things Sister Battle um, said it, our love relationship with Christ that allows our light to shine, that others will see the beauty of, of us as, um, you know, Seventh Day Adventists and why we honor the Sabbath in the way that we do. So I don't think it's a matter of, for me personally, of uh, what's being said, it's the spirit behind um, what's being said so yeah yeah um you know we are uh uh have become the very thing we criticize the jews for and uh that is a bunch of jerks you know uh <laughs> we we don't like the fact 
that people keep questioning our beliefs and why we do what we do. And so we take those beliefs and whip them with them. Uh, and some of the people who have said that they've been correct. And I don't think that part is in question. The issue is why? And that is what the lesson is trying to, in, to get into our souls is if you can't correct something, if you don't know why it exists. And at the very core of why it exists is we do, many of us have been in the church all this time and have never surrendered control to Christ. Wow, Amen. We want to be an active agent in our salvation. That's true. And, um, and the, the problem with that is, is as the lesson goes on, it's gonna show us that because the root is poisoned, we can't be an active agent. Notice how, as soon as I said, the thing about Mary and the virgin pregnancy and birth, people wanted to give her some credit. Well, she accepted it. She, see, that's the problem. That's but the problem. Did. Wait, wait a minute. It does not matter. God, it, even, even in her believing God, God prepared her all of her years to believe. Yes, yes. See, okay. and that is the, the problem is that we want credit and we don't have any credit to get. Yes. Salvation is a free gift. And this is why we struggle with it. Because if I cannot see where I made it happen in some small, give me the tiniest of bit of small credit. If I can't see where I have effectively uh, helped bring it to pass, then I can't control whether or not I can keep it, lose it, or even uh, believe that it's assured. And so all that is, is God bringing us to a place to understand once and for all that we must trust him. Any part, that's why she mentions Cain in this, in this talk, because anytime that we insert ourselves, we have contaminated the process. And we don't like that. We don't like to hear that. We don't like the way it feel, but it is the truth. And that's why instead of succeeding again and again, we tend to stumble again and again. Go ahead, Dr. Pam. Yes, um, and when you're talking about stumbling, how are we going to talk about the Sabbath and keeping the Sabbath and making sure things are the way it's supposed to be is a very important for commandment but we pay our musicians to play and they're actually working, whether we give them the money on a Sunday or a Friday or whatever, they have still done the work. Yeah, well, that is actually covered in scripture. Uh, unfortunately, it's not our topic tonight. We're not gonna even finish our topic tonight. So you ain't no way you gonna get me to open that one up. That's a whole, that's off topic. But that particular thing, about providing for the temple and the people that work in it is actually talked about thoroughly. Uh, are you listening? I that am is, listening, Pastor, okay, but I, I, I'm not going to make a comment, but I'll, I'll say it. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll have to discuss that at another time, but that particular topic is covered extensively in scripture. Uh, it's just a matter of going through it. Okay, so so uh, Elder Stone, we're gonna have to finish this. It's 8.14, my goodness, I had planned on letting y'all be done by eight o'clock, but I hope you've in, in, enjoyed this discussion like I have. Okay, Elder Stone, let's finish Man. this long paragraph. <laughs> okay, page 52, paragraph one. There has, not, there has not a point that needs to be dwelt upon more earnestly, repeated more frequently, or established more firmly in the minds of all than the impossibility of fallen man meriting anything by his own best good works. Salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ alone, unquote. Faith and works, page 18 and 19. <laughs> okay, so I think that right there is, uh, ah, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? 
<laughs> you know, uh, this is this is as you can see. If we were at that general Con 1888 general conference session, can you hear the people arguing this? I mean, we're just a one little church you know, people at prayer meeting trying to have the conversation and look how it's going. You know, can you imagine the fallout over this? But the that's not the real question. The question is is righteousness by faith alone <laughs> that's the question forget how we feel about it is it true is righteousness by faith alone or is there something that i can do that generates credit in heaven no no we can't no. do anything <laughs> okay no. all right all right i'm glad that we at least got that settled tonight but i promise you it is a organic, natural controversy that's going to be within us because our experience is going to always challenge the word of God. If we don't can, I, can I make them, can I say something, Pastor? Sure, go right ahead. I hear so many people saying, you know, what you can't do. You know, Sabbath, I look forward to it. If there's any mothers on there with little children, make their Sabbath uh, uh, breakfast the best they had all week, strawberries, bananas, whatever, and take them out to the park on Sabbath. Make them enjoy it. Sabbath should be, I didn't, I, anyway, I enjoyed planning Sabbaths for my kids. I enjoyed Sabbaths for myself. I, I didn't sit and listen to the preacher and for him to tell me what to do and make me feel that I was isolated, couldn't do this, couldn't do that. I leaned on Jesus because I had learned about Jesus before my mother ever became a, uh, uh, an Adventist, okay? You gotta let go and let God, if you look at other people, you'll never get be saved, okay? It's, you should have something just between you and Christ. Like Ina did. He walked with God so until God it's got to be you and God. If you're gonna look at what other people wear and other people do and what they eat, you ain't looking at Jesus. Okay, I'm gonna leave it alone. All right, thank you, Sister Whitlock. I'm gonna start getting the complex about you and preachers in a minute. But I, I do want to answer your question. Why do people spend so much time focusing on what we can and cannot do? Well, uh, we've got to be careful when we talk about that because it is God who has established what we can and cannot do. So we yes. can't present it as if it's a free, all, free for all and we can all create our own God and our own church and our own standards. I know that's not what you're saying, but I don't want anybody to mistake it that way. Now, let me go on to what you're really trying to say. The reason that we watch each other so closely is because many of us have never been converted. Once we are converted, we see people with the eyes of joy that we see Christ. Mm -hmm. We see people in the process and celebrate the fact that they used to crawl, but now they can hold on to stuff and pull themselves up. Oh, now you can walk a little bit. Oh, look at you, now mm -hmm. you're running. And I wanna celebrate that with you. But when we have not been converted, then grace is not a, 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 a in the picture. The only thing that's in the picture is the letter of the law, and I don't trust God to exact his law. I got to exact it. That's why people watch other people so carefully, because people aren't converted. And I know that that is, that is offensive, but it is the truth. Uh, Sister Hood, go right ahead. Yeah, just to that end, just on the flip side of that, Pastor Hood, uh, it's not always a matter of people are watching other people just to see, you know, whether or not you're going to do right, you're not going to do right. Sometimes it's just simply a matter of when I do what I do openly, then I can't help but be seen because of the forum that I choose to do that which I do. So it's not, you know, and, and I'll just use myself. It's not a matter of of me looking all the time to see fault or find fault 
and my brother and my sister. That's not why I come to the church. That's not why I go. And yet you cannot not see what you see when it's very open and blatant. And, you know, not that it's my job to go and, and, you know, be the, be the Adventist police, uh, you know, but at the same time, what do you do when uh, individuals are so bold in the stance that they take when it is contrary to the word of God? Now, personally, I, I want to pray. You know, I want to pray and, 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 and take it to the Lord as opposed to trying, like I say, to police people. And um, so, yes, just for the balance of the conversation is that there is a personal responsibility that comes along with it as well. All right. Are you making me think you didn't hear what I just said? In my, my, I talked about. Yes, two, I heard what you said. I am just giving my wait two cents. Wait a minute. I talked to about the, two types of people. The first type don't want no rules. They want to create their own God. Uh, in other words, I can, uh, whatever God that I can imagine and be comfortable with, that's going to be our God. The one that just let me do whatever. I'm not giving any credibility to those people. Those people have that attitude because they have not been converted. Then there is another type, which is they uh, are like Uzzah and the ark, right? They, 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 they are afraid that it's gonna tip over. So they uh, are not trusting God with his church. They believe that if they don't do anything, the church is gonna fall apart. So those are two situations. There's the offender who isn't converted. And then there's the observer who's not converted because and he's not saying he don't love God. He's not saying any of that. He's just saying, I see the ark about to tip over. And I know they said, trust God, but I'm compelled that I must stop it from tipping over. That person is just as disobedient as the one who wants to create their own standards. And I don't know what I'm not talking about either that person. Yeah, yeah, I'm just saying, that's why I asked, did you hear what I said? Yes, so it's not, <laughs> yes, I heard what you said. And what I said is not, is not what you just said is not that either. Oh, I get it. I get it. What do you do when people blatantly defy uh, God's standards? What do you do? Well, we follow the policies God has put in place. He has set some people in place to correct and even to put people out if necessary. And those people who are appointed to do that are few, not many. All right, Brother Parker, go ahead. I was listening to what everybody was saying and I thought about something I learned a long time ago and it's based on scripture. Scripture says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Mm. People are gonna say what's in their heart. They're gonna bring it out and let you hear it and then Another translation of that is like this. What's ever in you is going to come out. Good or bad, it's going to come out. Mm. It comes out sometimes at the wrong time. And most of the time, that's when you're in the church because you, as you were saying earlier, want to make sure everybody understand where, where you stand and how you feel. Mm. Yeah, good point. Good point. I, and, and all of these things are just proving that we need God, you know, think about it. If he said, okay, y'all, y'all got it. I've shown you enough, y'all go ahead and handle that. It would be a mess, <laughs> you know, we would be in combat constantly. It really does take God to save anybody, even the people who want to be saved. And, uh, and I think it's, it's here. Uh, we're gonna let this end it, this last, uh, little statement here because I want it to be the words from the book and not my words that make these points that I've been trying to make and maybe I haven't been effective in making them. So uh, uh, we're changing subjects now, but we're not going deep into it, just a paragraph into it. Uh, Elder Stone, are you still there? Yes. Everybody all right? Everybody okay? Oh, yes. Oh, all yes. Right. The ready? Sure Foundation Justification page 52, paragraph three. Before Adam chose to sin, he was in a righteous state of being before God. 
he could have continued to develop a righteous character by obeying God's law. But after he willfully decided not to trust God, mm. a decision revealed through his disobedience, he placed himself in an unrighteous state, the carnal nature. No longer could his obedience to the law secure for him a righteous standing before God. Mercy. Also, he could pass on to his children only the same fallen nature that he now possessed. Therefore, all his descendants were like him in that by trying to do good, they could never return to a holy state of being and eradicate their carnal natures. See Steps to Christ, page 62. Mercy. Okay, we're ending with this. I could, this get good after this, but we gotta do that next week. Do you see it now? Adam is in a righteous state of being before God. Now, I really want to flip your wig right here. And please forgive me, no pun intended. <laughs> that, that his wife, Eve, only knew him in this righteous state. And then when Adam disobeys by doing what Eve had already done, but God is looking at Adam, right? When Adam disobeys, now it is impossible for Eve to see Adam in this righteous state again. There's always the question now of when I am dealing with my husband that he could fall. That is an unintended consequence, but it's a truth anyhow. Likewise, Adam now is doubtful that should uh, my wife have a choice between God and Satan, I can't say with a surety that she's going to choose God. Now, I want you to really think about that for a minute. Because in this moment, this is the whole church, these two people. You ever thought about that? The whole first church are these two people. One was pulled up out of another one. And they still got problems. I mean, he was, she was his rib. And they still have issues. <laughs> so how in the world do we believe that we're going to work together in harmony without surrender? Because that's all that we've been talking about from the beginning of tonight's lesson. We see it all the time. I mean, whether we in Sabbath school or in this setting or whatever we're in, somebody say something, somebody else got to come back and, and prove how that which was said was wrong. All of it is just demonstrating that the root is poisoned. No matter how well our intentions are or what we are trying to do, we cannot rub away the stain of that unrighteous state in a physical and carnal way. There must be a spiritual blood transfusion that takes place in all of us or else we have already failed. Everything else is an exercise in futility, even with the best of intentions. This is our last discussion and then we're letting it go for tonight. I hope you've enjoyed it. If there's someone who wants to respond to that, you are more than welcome to come on in and then we're going to be done. All right, mighty quiet. You're gonna make me think I did good. Go ahead. It's very, it's very clear that Adam could have <laughs> remained in his righteous state, but once, once that was broken, mercy. We we all are born like that, all messed up, twisted, crooked. Mm. And so it's as it makes sense when you think of it, how can this crooked be made straight by anything that we do? No, we have to just take it back to the manufacturer. 
That's right. That's right. That's right. And it is insanity. And you can quote me on this. It is insanity to believe that everybody has to go back to the manufacturer except me. I get it. It's y'all that don't get it. <laughs> and this is typically what Christians do. We may not intend to present ourselves that way, but this is how we come off to people. You know, I don't know what's wrong with you. I'm good. And then you know, we wonder why the church struggles to grow. Go ahead, sis. Another thing too that that um, they they weren't ignorant about what they were doing. Right now, if, if if you just read the Bible when you're a kid, it's Friday he made them, Sabbath they rested, Sunday they messed up. <laughs> but if you read Patriarchs and Prophets, he talks about how Jesus came down every day in the heat of the day and explain the whole great controversy, the war in heaven, and everything to them. The angels would talk to them and tell them about all of this. So they weren't ignorant. It wasn't like, um, you know, we didn't know. You know, we, we, we made a mistake. They knew. They knew what it was about. But they went ahead anyway. And here we are. We don't have all that. Right. And we're we're doing the same thing. Yeah, good point. Very good point. Um, just a quick thought, Pastor. You know, um, just looking at the first family, Adam and Eve. You know, um, just bring it to our family today. We can't say everybody has to give an a, an account before God. I can't say, oh, my husband, you know, because I'm in the church mm. and my husband um, don't want me to do this. And my husband caused that because everyone has to give an account. Yeah. You know, some of us let our family wants to rule us when it comes to God. Don't give this money. Don't give that. You're doing too much. You're doing too, you know, and stuff like that. But we all have to give an account, you know, because God is going to deal with us individually, just like we dealt with Adam and Eve individually. That's right. That's right. All right, y'all. Uh, I hope that uh, these discussions have stimulated your thinking and got you all fired up. All of that is a wonderful thing. And it's a good thing. And uh, I believe that at the end of it all, we'll be closer than we've ever been. And God will be able to use us in ways that he never could because we weren't on the same page. And that's all that's happening with these discussions. Anyone else before we close out tonight? Um, Pastor, can I give a quick little testimony because we were praying about something earlier. Um, you know, I was praying about my daughter finances and what was going on. We just prayed about it. She called me and said, Mom, I just got a check in the mail. She just found a check in our mailbox that she wasn't even expecting. So to God be the glory. And we just praying over it. Amen. 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 My my daughter is uh, dealing with uh, a stimulus check issue. She never got uh, any of hers, and they've been trying to, you know, investigate where it's gone because somebody got it, but she never got it. So I understand that issue. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. I anyone else? Okay, well, thank you so much for participating in this lively topic. We will continue. He's going deeper on next week when it comes to justification. We're going to spell it out. And uh, my prayer is that we're all here. And if we're not here, that the, that means the Lord has come and got us. So he can explain it himself uh, if he comes before then. I'm sure everybody will be all right with that. All right, let's have prayer, and we look forward to seeing you on Friday night. Lord, thank you for our time together tonight. Thank you for people who have been willing to offer their thoughts and be able to even go back and forth a little bit just because we love you and we want to get it right. We don't want to disappoint you, and neither do we want to disappoint people around us. We want to uh, learn how to lean and depend on you in a healthy way. Lord, my prayer is that everyone on this call and everyone connected to us grows as a result of the 
uh, time we put in studying your word. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty.